I'm delighted to introduce our keynote speaker for our AAU retreat. And um, David joined us, was able to join us last night for the dinner and reception, and I hope some of you had a chance to talk to him. But certainly, if not last night, then perhaps a little bit this morning. Uh, David Asai is Senior Director in Science Education at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And in this capacity, he directs the HHMI undergraduate and graduate programs, which include grants to colleges, research universities, and as well as the HHMI professor scheme, research fellowships to undergraduates, graduate students, and medical students, as well as the Science Education Alliance. David received his bachelor's in chemistry and master's in biology from Stanford and his doctorate in biology from Caltech. He was a Muscular Dystrophy Association postdoc at Caltech and an NIH and RSA postdoc at UC Santa Barbara. Until 2010, when he closed his lab, his group studied the structure and functional diversity of the molecular motor dynein in sea urchins in, and sea, in sea urchins and tetrahymena thermophila. Before moving to HHMI in 2008, David was on the faculty for 19 years at Purdue and for five years at Harvey Mudd College. He served as head of biological sciences at Purdue and was Stuart Mudd professor and chair of biology at Harvey Mudd. David served as a member of the boards of trustees of the National Purdue Teaching Academy and the Higher Learning Commission North Central Association. He's an elected member of the Purdue Teaching Academy and was inducted into Purdue's Book of Great Teachers. We should start one of those here. Uh, he currently serves on many, many advisory committees, too many to list all of here, but some of them include the Progress Through Calculus Project of the Mathematical Association of America, the University of Delaware NSF Advanced Institutional Transformation Project, the Minority Affairs Committee of the American Society for Cell Biology, the Committee on Opportunities in Service of the AAAS, and the NIH Advisory Committee of the Directors Working Group on Diversity. So I'm absolutely delighted and grateful that David was able to join us today, and today the title of his talk is The Problem with the Pipeline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me up here. It's, uh, the weather here is a lot better than it is in D.C., so I really appreciate uh, your, your, your hospitality. Um, it's also uh, good for me to come in and meet and, and talk with faculty who are actually walking the walk. I, I realize that having moved to a place like Howard Hughes almost seven years ago, I get a lot of, I get, I get to talk a lot, but I no longer am doing the kind of work that you're doing. And uh, it's easy for any of us to get up here and, you know, tell people what it should be, but you all are working to actually make it happen. So I really appreciate what you're doing. And uh, I, I was very interested in listening to some of the conversations this morning and to your report outs. In fact, I was scrambling. I thought, oh, I, it, I better change all my slides because you guys are all, you're all ahead of me here. So uh, you'll, you'll forgive me if, if some of the stuff that I talk about is stuff that you already know. Part of my job is to tell you what you already know. Um, and uh, you should understand that I use this talk when I, when I talk with uh, universities and uh, other uh, folks who are in the academic uh, world, and sometimes they're not as far along as you are. I want to start my story, though, with a very personal story, and this starts on Terminal Island in, uh, outside of Los Angeles. So Terminal Island is a, is a place in, the, in Long Beach Harbor, Los Angeles Harbor, it is the place uh, where actually the, the largest number of shipping containers come into the United States. Terminal Island today is a, is a, is a port, but back in 1941, when World War II began, Terminal Island was the home for about 3,000 Japanese Americans who were living there, uh, working in the fishing industry and the canner, cannery in, industry. And this included my father, his sister, and their mother. Here's a picture of my father. Uh, you can see the, uh, the shipping, you know, the, the cranes and stuff in the background. Uh, my father died about a year ago now uh, in, in, in his 100th year. So if you think about 100 years, he saw a lot. 
And uh, I just want to tell you just a second about, about his, his story. So as I said, in 1941, Terminal Island was, was a fishing village. Japanese Americans were either fishing or they were working in the canneries. My father had already gone to college. He had a degree from the University of California, Berkeley. There was no work for him. And so he was working as a gardener in Long Beach. When, when World War II happened in December of 41, as you know, all of the Japanese Americans on the West Coast, two thirds of them US citizens by birth, were put into internment camps. And this, of course, certainly occurred very quickly for the 3,000 people on Terminal Island because they were sitting in the middle of Los Angeles Harbor. And so they moved, and my father, his sister, and their mother uh, moved from Los Angeles to a place called Poston, Arizona, which was the internment camp that uh, they lived for a while. Actually, my grandmother, my father's mother, died in camp. She was 48 years old. Um, my father was raised as a Buddhist, uh, but there, were, there weren't many Buddhist things going on in the camp. And one of the things that was very important for him in the camp were that there were Christian uh, uh, missionaries there. And so he thought, well, maybe I should become, maybe he should become, uh, think about working in, in the Christian church. And so from post in Arizona, he moved to Albion, Michigan, where he worked as a janitor at the Star Commonwealth for Boys and also coached. But he was continuing to think about service, Christianity, that, that kind of stuff. So he moved from there to Buffalo, New York, where he worked for a church for a while. And then he applied to seminary. And so if you know anything about being a minister, you know, you have to go to school, you have to get a degree. And so he applied to seminaries. And the only seminary that would take him, or one of the few that would take him because of his race, was Andover Newton in Massachusetts, outside of Boston. Andover Newton happens to be a place that trains congregational ministers at the time, and so my father became a congregational minister. Uh, as a congregational minister, uh, if you know anything about the congregational denomination, it is so called because the congregation gets to decide. There's no bishops or hierarchy, and so if a church is large and they have a large number of people in the congregation, they can afford a pretty fancy preacher. If they're small, they can afford, well, they'll get whatever they can afford, which are usually lesser uh, preachers. Well, my father's uh, career then was really uh, determined by the kinds of churches that could afford to have him. And indeed, these were very small churches. Frankly, he was as good as they could get. Uh, they had to settle for what my father was. And so he served small churches in Vermont. This is where uh, my brother and I joined the family. We then moved to Kansas in the middle of nowhere. Um, in Kansas, I started school. Um, we were the only non-whites in the school. We were the only non-whites in the town. We were some of the very few non-whites in the county. I should just say that there were two boys in my class, and so it was a very small place. And then finally, in the sixth grade, my father moved us to Maui. And in Maui, uh, we were suddenly in the majority. In fact, there was only one Haole guy in the class, and so I, I sort of experienced both of these things. The whole point of all this is that for my father's life, his life, his, his, his education, what he could do for a living, where he lived, how he could raise his family, were, was largely determined, determined by his race, by his, by his ethnicity, by his nationality. And so race matters. So I want to talk this morning with you about myths and metaphors. I changed my title, Kathy, sorry. Um, before we talk about myths and me metaphors, I wanted to just remind you about some data, some truths. And I'm going to go very quickly here because um, I, think, I think you're quite familiar with this stuff. So first of all, diversity is good for science. You know this. You've been talking about this. Scott Page has written about this in his book, The Difference. And there's also a YouTube. He's, he's done several of these talks. And, and that particular YouTube at the University of California, San Diego, I think is particularly terrific because he shows how you measure the impact of diversity. And so what Scott Page tells us in his book are a number of things, but here are three points. He makes the point that diversity trumps individual ability under, under the following three conditions. First, when the field, 
that is the group that's trying to solve the problems depends on groups of problem solvers. Now, diversity is not a property of an individual. A diversity is a property of a group of people. So I cannot be diverse, but I can add diversity to a group. And so if you think about how science is done, we depend on groups. We depend on groups. We have lab groups. We have departments. We have study sections. We have so professional societies. We belong to universities. Without those groups, science wouldn't be the same. And so that certainly fits the criteria. That science certainly fits uh, Page's first point. The second is that diversity trumps individual ability when the field benefits by adding different perspectives, interpretations, and tools. And again, if you think about science, especially the hard stuff that we're trying to do, we always benefit from different perspectives. And then finally, diversity trumps individual ability when the problem is difficult. And in fact, Page shows that the harder the problem, the more the benefit of the diversity of the problem solvers. And if you think about science, at least in my field, all the easy stuff's been done. The hard stuff remains, remains to be done, and so we would benefit by having a diverse group of problem solvers. Now, this morning, I'm going to be talking about diversity mainly in the context of race and ethnicity. I know that diversity can be measured in any number of different ways, and those are all important. And those different ways, those different parts of the spectrum of, of diversity all fit what Paige is talking about. But I think for scientists, we have a hard time talking about race and ethnicity, and so I want to focus on that. All right, well, Paige tells us, and we know, that diversity is good for science. So we got some good news in this country. We know that our talent pool is already quite diverse. Here's a plot in blue is the US population total. We're now a little bit over 300 million. And in red is the percentage of the US population that are persons of color, of, of minorities. And so right now, this country is about 37% minorities. So that's good news, because that means that we have a large mix of diversity. And further, we know that in just a few decades, the US population will flip to so-called majority minority. So in 2010, the US population census, in blue, you see whites. In red, persons of color. About a third of the folks are persons of color in 2010. Before the, the year 2050, that population will flip. And so the majority of the US population will be persons of color. Now, I'm not going to live to 2050, probably. And so I can say, wow, that's a long ways off. But in fact, it's upon us today. Because this is a plot, according to the US Department of Education, of the percentage of students in public schools, K through 12 schools, who are persons of color, that are who, who are minorities. And it was last year, in 2014, the last school year, 2014-15, when that population of school kids flipped in this country. So beginning in the fall of 2014, the majority of public school kids, that's about 50 million kids in K through 12, were majority minority, majority persons of color. And so the numbers that I would just point out is by, in, in about 27 years, we expect the US population to, to go to majority minority. And it was last year that the school kids flipped. And of course, we're all in education. So if we're not concerned or if we're not interested in, in who the school students are, um, we're not paying attention to the right stuff. All right, so this is exciting, right? So the <laughs> diversity is good. You know that a lot of this diversity is coming from children of immigrants. And so that's also a, a good uh, difference maker in terms of the diversity of thinking that might be going on. And so how are we doing in the United States? Well, the current US talent pool, that is persons who are of the age of work, working is about now 30% underrepresented minorities. By underrepresented minorities, I'm talking about African Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans. So I'm not talking about Asians or Asian Americans. So it's about 30% underrepresented minorities, and the scientific workforce is about 9% underrepresented minorities. And so the scientific community is not taking advantage of this rich talent pool. And that's to the detriment of science because diversity would make science better. Here's just some data. These are national data. Notice that the scales are different. Natural scientists on the left, engineering on the right. 
in blue are all of the baccalaureates that have been awarded over the 10 year period from 2000, actually the 12 year period from 2000 to 2011. And in red is the percentage of underrepresented minorities. Again, the, the scales are different, so uh, just, just remember that. And here is the US PhD. So now these are US, either, um, either US citizens or, or uh, permanent residents who received PhDs in the last decade. In, now these are total numbers rather than percentages in the natural sciences and in the engineering. In blue is the total number of PhDs that we've awarded in this country. And in red are the numbers of underrepresented minorities. And you can see that the number of underrepresented minorities who are receiving PhDs is going up slightly, but not very quickly. Here's a different way of looking at same, that same data. So what I've tried to do here is I've tried to plot the percentage of underrepresented minorities in two different populations, the US population in blue and science PhDs in red. So the US population today is about 30% underrepresented minorities. The science PhDs by underrepresented minorities is about 9% today. If we were to do the following thought experiment, let's assume that the US population will not change for the rest of, our, for the rest of eternity. So let's just say that the US population will remain at 30% underrepresented minorities forever. We can do a simple thought experiment about, well, so how long would it take for us to achieve parity in terms of the underrepresented minorities who would be earning science PhDs? And that answer is something around 100 years from now. But of course, the US population is not going to remain at 30% minorities. It's going to go up. So by the year 2050, we know that it'll be close to 50%. And so I would suggest that the United States, in order to find parity, needs to try something different in terms of helping diversify our scientific workforce. We need a different way of thinking about this challenge. And if we don't, I would argue that we are um, a, an enterprise without a future. The undergraduate experience is critical. And you've all been talking about undergraduate science education. And I just wanted to remind you about what you already know. It's important, of course, because undergraduate is the undergraduate time is when this is sort of the last organized time for large numbers of students to begin to think about how they could become whatever they're going to become to gain their identities, or at least to begin to think about their identities in whatever they're going to become, and to acquire some of the skills. And you know, in, in science, in STEM, we, uh, we have a large number of students who are interested in studying STEM. The Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA tells us that at least 40% of all incoming freshmen want to study STEM. Other studies say up to 48%. And so that's about 1.5 million students every year coming into college saying they want to study STEM. And in our wisdom, we have, well, this is a large number, right? So you have to deal with it somehow. And so we, at many places, have what we'll call gateway courses. And the idea of a gateway is, this is a gate. It's open, it's welcoming. You see the promised lands back there walk through that gate, and things are good. So there, here's really what happens in the nation. So we're going to start off with 100 students coming into college interested in studying science, in studying STEM. 30% of them in the yellow are, persons of, are, are, are underrepresented minorities. We put these students through our gateway courses nationally. And before the end of their sophomore year, most of them are gone. In fact, more than 60% of all of the students leave STEM, and more than 80% of all of the underrepresented minorities leave STEM. Now, you've all been talking about that. You've all been making these observations. I was sitting at the table here, and you, were, you, you see this even at your places. I should also say, and, and Sylvia Hurtado's work again shows this, that places the, the, the most elite institutions in this country, Brown and Penn being among them, you have a special challenge. 
Because the students who come to you, especially the underrepresented minorities, are less likely to persist in science than if they didn't come to you. So even though they're good enough to get into Penn, they're good enough to get into Brown, the national the, the data, Sylvia's data shows very clearly that the odds that they will persist in science and STEM is actually less than if they had gone to, uh, a, a, say, a state university. We can talk about why that might be, and I think some of you have been thinking about that. But that's a, I think that's an important challenge for all of us. Because you are some of the best, you, know, you have some of the best science going on at your universities. And so, wow, what a, what a missed opportunity. All right. So instead of this welcoming gate with the promised land, really what we're doing is we are, and, and in some cases, arguably by necessity, weeding out a large number of students. If we look at the top US research universities, um, I just wanted to share with you some numbers. So the 203 refers to the very high and high research universities as classified by the Carnegie Foundation. You're there. The 60 AAU, of course, are the 60 US universities that belong to the Association of American Universities. You're also there. And then Brown and Penn, well, you're clearly there. And so here are just some numbers. Now, these numbers, these are federal numbers um, drawn, as you see at the bottom there. These are data that are slightly old. And I was asking my friends from Brown about some of their numbers. But I'm just going to show you what the numbers that we have based on the uh, federal uh, numbers. The undergraduates, you see that there are 3.3 million at these 203 universities. AAU schools at 1.1 million. 14 to 18% of those students are underrepresented minorities. If you look at science degrees, so science baccalaureates per year, if you look at the AAU schools, for example, 31,000 or so baccalaureates per year, 2,900 of them, or about 9.5%, 9, 9 are to underrepresented minorities. Your brown and pen numbers are over there to the far right. And then if we ask how many of these baccalaureates went on for a PhD, so these are baccalaureate origins for science PhDs, you have the following numbers. And just look at Brown and Penn, for example. For all students per year, about 80, 81 of your baccalaureates earn a PhD in the sciences. Four underrepresented minorities earn a PhD in the sciences. And so we look at these data, and we can talk about a yield. And here is the yield numbers. So yield simply, I'm calling it a yield. It's the PhDs per baccalaureate origin. Right? So the number of the percentage of students who received a baccalaureate from your school who went on for a PhD in the sciences. And so what you see is that, and this is what you would expect, right? For all students in green, the, uh, the more selective the universities, I guess, if you will, the greater the percentage of your yield, the greater your yield. So Brown and Penn together have about 13.7% of all of your students who go on to get a PhD. For the underrepresented minorities, nationally, regardless of whether we're talking about the research universities, the AAU schools, or Brown and Penn, the difference, the disparity is almost twofold. So getting a PhD, of course, is not the only outcome that we want for our students. But it's a measure of how well we might be preparing our students for science. And so when we look at these data, and these data have not changed over many, many decades now, when we look at these data, it, it raises some concerns. So when I give these talks, I, I hear from faculty, and they'll tell me why these sorts of things happen, and it's not their fault. And so I just wanted to share with you three myths that we hear from time to time. First is that, well, they're not interested. These are minority students. But here are some data. If we look at the students who enter college, and we look at the US population, so here we're plotting the percentage in a particular population who are underrepresented minorities. And these are data from about almost 10 years ago now. So the US population is about 20, back then it was about 28, 29% underrepresented minorities. And the entering students who are coming into science, that is wanting to study science as freshmen, 
are also about 28% underrepresented minorities. So there is a strong interest amongst minorities to study science. And in fact, what we see now is that minorities are overrepresented amongst those students who want to study science coming into college. But if you look at the science baccalaureates in the third bar there, only about 17% of the baccalaureates are minorities, and only 9% of our PhDs are um, minorities. So something's happening in the undergraduate time. But it's not for lack of interest. Well, here's a second myth. They're not prepared. There was a study that was done and published back in 2000. And this, this group looked at a large number of students. And they tracked them from the beginning of high school all the way through the end of college, 17,000 or something students. And they really did two, two things in this study. The first was that they asked, so what are the predictors for success in STEM once you get to college? And the second question was, well, once you get to college and you're interested in studying STEM, what happens to these students five years after they start college? So here are the data from the second set. So what you can do is you can take these students who started college wanting to study STEM, and you can basically ask, after five years, there are four different outcomes. One is they completed their degree in STEM. One second is that they're persisting. That is, they're staying in the degree program that they plan to in STEM, but they haven't yet finished, but they're persisting. The third is that they switched out. So instead of staying in STEM, they moved into another discipline. And the fourth option, the fourth outcome, is that they left school. In dark blue are whites and Asians. In light blue are underrepresented minorities. And what I think you can see very clearly by these data is, first of all, the underrepresented minorities are not failing or leaving school at any greater rate than the whites and Asians. But second, the switch rate amongst those who uh, started off in STEM is significantly higher for underrepresented minorities. And in this study, this, the, folks then, the authors then go on to say that even when you control for the factors that we know will predict success in STEM, that is, the student went to a high school that offered something more than Algebra 1, that the student went to a high school that offered at least a lab course with a science course, and that the student comes from a family that valued uh, college education, although they did not necessarily have had to go, have gone to college themselves. When you control for those factors, you find that the underrepresented minorities still switch out of STEM at about two and a half times the rate that whites and Asians do. And so I would suggest that these data and other kinds of data suggest that not only are students who are minorities interested in science, but at least there's a large number of them that are also prepared to be successful in science. And yet there's something that happens where we discourage underrepresented minorities at a much greater rate nationally. The third myth is this. It's, it's for their own good. And a way of looking at this is what my favorite Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas has written about in several cases. And here's one particular case. This was uh, an opinion. Uh, that he wrote concurring with the Fisher versus the Uni University of Texas. This is the affirmative action case a couple years ago at the University of Texas. And Clarence Thomas, as I said, has written about this a lot. And we refer to this as the mismatch hypothesis. I'm just going to read what he said. By the way, his concurring opinion, right? he's, he's agreeing with the majority. His concurring opinion is longer than the opinion, because he's got a lot to say. The underlining is mine. As a result of the mismatching, Many blacks and Hispanics who likely would have excelled at less elite schools are placed in a position where underperformance is all but inevitable because they are less academically prepared than the white and Asian students with whom they must compete. So what Justice Thomas is suggesting here are two things. First of all, he's saying that if you uh, are mismatched, if you don't belong, if you shouldn't be aspiring to go to the very best school, right? you should be going to the, maybe the lesser schools. So if you're mismatched, then you're inevitably going to fail. You're going to underperform. You're going to drop out. You're going to get a lower set of grades or whatever. And second, he's saying that if there is mismatch, it somehow applies to blacks and Hispanics, and it doesn't apply to others. Well, it turns out that there's been a study that's actually looked at this, and it was by um, just good fortune. Kurlander and Grodsky published this a couple of years ago. It turns out that at the University of California, back in 2004, 
The University of California, as it always is, was in some sort of a budget crisis. Now, if you know about the University of California, in 2004, the Merced hadn't yet been built. So there were, um, there were I think, eight undergraduate campuses. So you've got to be really good to get into the UC. Right? The UC, this California system has three tiers, really. The, the, the UC system, the Cal State system, and then the junior college system. So you've got to be really good to begin with to get into the UCs. But at the UCs of the most those eight schools, there's a hierarchy. There are three schools that are really good. Berkeley, San Diego, and Los Angeles, UCLA, San Diego, and, and Berkeley. And they have a very, uh, very elite, you know, very, very selective. And then if you're good, but you're not quite good enough, then you can get into the other five UC campuses. Well, in 2004, there was this natural experiment that occurred because of the budget problems. They didn't have enough seats in the schools. And so what they offered to students was a so-called guaranteed transfer option, a GTO option. So a student who might have been accepted into one of the UC schools could, if she chose to, go to community college for a semester or for a year, and then she was guaranteed transfer to any of the UC schools she wanted to. So even if she was only good enough to get into UC Santa Barbara, if she so cho chose, she could go to UCLA or to Berkeley or to San Diego. And so 2,300 students were part of this GTO thing. And of these 491, when it was time for them to go to a UC, chose to go to something beyond their, uh, right? They, they wouldn't have been accepted into these elite schools. And so what happened to these, these so-called mismatched students? Well, the data are that the GPAs of the GTO students were statistically the same as the students who would have already been accepted into these universities. The GTO students were no more or less likely to drop out. Actually, they were less likely to drop out than the students who did not go to the, U the elite schools and for, finally, even if there is any sort of mismatch, there was no evidence that it applied only to blacks and Hispanics. So it's these kinds of data that I think are, are important when we think about these myths that we all hold. All right, so I want to switch gears. I want to talk just for a few minutes about metaphors. You know, metaphors are powerful, and they're often useful. Uh, the information superhighway, or the war on cancer. These are all very powerful metaphors that guide policy. They, they, they guide the way we measure progress. But they also can be constraining. So as you know, the, the metaphor that we use in science education, especially when it, when it applies to underrepresented minorities, is the pipeline. So let's think about a pipeline for a moment. A pipeline's job is to transport a commodity, water, oil, from one end of the pipe to the other end. It can be a very long pipe. And when this pipeline is working, it doesn't leak. It moves whatever's, whatever the commodity is from one end all the way to the other end. A pipeline like this also has strategically placed pumping stations to help the commodity get over whatever hills or whatever might be there. And when we talk about the pipeline in science education, we often then wring our hands and we say, oh my gosh, the STEM pipeline is leaking badly. Look at all these students who are leaking out. And, and, and so by the time you get to the end, there's only a fraction of the students who finish in STEM versus all the students who started off. And that's all I think very useful for us to think about how many students we lose. But let's think a little bit differently about the so-called STEM pipeline. And this is my drawing of a pipeline. It looks sort of like a pipette. And I'm going to just talk about the undergraduate years. But in fact, if you talk with your colleagues, what you'll hear, I th well, what you might hear, or maybe I just hear this and you won't. But what I hear is that, you know, this pipeline can go on for a long time. When I talk to people who train graduate students, they say, you know, we could do a great job with minorities. But the undergraduates, they're just I mean, you know, if you just gave me some good undergraduates, then we could do a good job with graduate students. So that pipeline could go longer. And when I talk to undergraduate folks, they say, you know, we could do a great job. But at the high schools, they just aren't preparing the students. And when I talk to high school teachers, they say, you know, we could do a great job. But if it's a third grade, that, and so indeed, this pipeline could go on much longer. But let's just think about the undergraduate STEM pipeline. So here it is, one end at the top, where there's input, 
the other end is the bottom, right? After four years, five years, the kids are supposed to leave. All right, so here's the reality. And I want to think about this in three parts. I want to think, first of all, about the input. So who is entering, and, and how are they getting to college? Well, here's a quote from the PCAST report, published in 2012. And again, I'm going to just read it for you. There was a time when most people who attended college were single white men, had high school diplomas, started college at age 18, graduated in four years, and had all the academic preparation needed to succeed, and had few family responsibilities. It goes on, in the 21st century, this is not true. Today, students come from diverse backgrounds, have widely divergent levels of preparation, may be returning to college after years in the workforce or serving in the US military, and often are employed while in college to support themselves and families. Now, two of the important populations of students who are coming into college are transfer students and first-generation students. That is, students who get some of their education at community colleges, so-called transfer students, and first-generation students. That is, students who belong to a family in which the parents did not achieve or attain a baccalaureate degree. And these are significant contributors. Uh, according to the NSF, about half of all STEM baccalaureates went to community college at some point in their time. About 20% of all STEM PhDs went to community college. Uh, about nearly a quarter of all undergraduates and 16% of undergrads at four-year institutions are first-generation students. And when we look at the data, these two populations of students, and these aren't the only two populations that we should, we should be concerned about, but they are a significant, number, a significant part of the population. When we look at these two, what we find is that ethnic minorities and persons from under uh, underprivileged uh, backgrounds from low back from low income backgrounds are overrepresented amongst these populations and certainly achieving far less and here are just some data so in a very complicated slide um, what I'd like you to see is that the transfer data are on the left first generation students are on the right the transferred students the transfer data is simply comparing populations of students who start off at two-year schools versus four-year schools. So two-year schools in the dark blue, four-year schools in the light blue. In the first generation, first generation students are in the dark purple versus students whose parents have a baccalaureate degree are in the light, lighter color. And so what I hope you can see is that underrepresented minorities, for example, are more, uh, they're overrepresented, frankly, in the transfer group and in the first generation group. Uh, the lowest economic quartile is more represented in the transfer students and in the first generation uh, uh, group. Here are the outcomes of these, these same populations of students. So what we see is that there is about a six-fold chance, a better probability of attaining a baccalaureate if the student started off at a four-year school than if she transferred from a two-year school. That's the stuff on the left. And on the right, there's about a three-fold better probability that a student who is not a first-generation student will finish the baccalaureate than a first-generation student. So these are significant challenges for us. Because if students are coming to us from different pathways, then if we're interested in the introductory experience, especially those first two years, then how are we going to include everyone? So instead of that simple model where students all come from high school, we know that the pathways will look like this, and they're even f much further, much, much more complicated. All right, I think about this perhaps as a watershed more than uh, a pipeline. But a watershed also has its limitations. And actually, I don't favor using any sort of metaphor when we talk about students coming into college. All right, the second point that I just wanted to make very quickly is, well, so we talked about the input. We know that it's not just one way that they're coming into this college. What happens to them as they leave college? And we know some of the data. We know that students will come from different places, and then they will be leaving. So a large number of students, whether they're white or minorities, will be switching out of STEM. And we know that a large number of our students who are taking their introductory courses are basically getting one taste of science. They're taking one science course. Maybe they're interested, and then they go on and they do something else. We also know that the output, of course, isn't just to, be, to make people like us, but in fact, there are all kinds of different careers. And so how do we think about this when we think about our students? I like to think about these students who get the one taste. The students who take one 
course in science, and then they do something else. And instead of thinking about them as a failure, I think we should think about them as a real opportunity. Because those students are going to go on and become teachers and writers and historians and politicians. Some of them might get to the Senate. Probably not. Uh, business persons, parents, voters. And so if their one taste of science is also their last course, then we should, I think, especially at the leading institutions, give those students the very best that we can. We should make them happy. We should make them like science, even if they don't stay in science. So a lot of times that we think about this pipeline and we wring our hands about how much it's leaking and how many students are leaving, we think about those retention rates that I shared with you earlier. Well, in fact, the world really can't work with 1.5 million more PhDs every year in science. We have to accept the fact that many of the students will be leaving, and so let's try to do a good job with them, knowing full well that most of them will not stay in science, celebrate that fact, and don't piss them off. All right, so then the third point that I wanted to consider with my pipeline is what happens in the middle. And I want to just make two observations. The first is that students are not a commodity. We think of a pipeline as moving water or oil, a commodity. But in fact, students are making choices every day. And so to think of them as an, an inert commodity, I think, is just inaccurate. And the second, and this has to do with us, is that the faculty are not a passive piece of pipe. We have a responsibility. So this brings me to my fourth myth. And I hear this a lot. Well, you know, we have these problems. And but I can't do anything about it. I'm just a faculty member teaching intro bio. I'm not the dean, or I'm not the, I don't make the, I don't have any money. I think there's a lot that faculty can do, and you all have been struggling and thinking about how you can work with your colleagues to do this. The other way of saying this, though, and, 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 I, and I probably, uh, well, I want to say this, uh, even if I run out of time, is that you know when we think about students, especially underrepresented students, we often think about interventions. We think about interventions to help them, give them research experiences, offer them a summer bridge program, uh, do remedial coursework, um, you know, all the stuff that we have to do, and I think it's great that we are doing it. But a way of thinking about that is that this is also a form of blaming the victim. That when I do an intervention to help the victim to help the student get better. Clearly, that's important. But that's not the whole part of this. I, as a faculty member, have an enormous responsibility to learn about how to get better at this. And often, our interventions don't think about us. They always think about, well, what can we do for the students or with the students? So I can't do anything about it. And I would suggest that there are several things that we can do. And here are three. First of all, I think it's important that we think very hard about changing the introductory experience. You all are thinking about that. You know that uh, active learning is much more effective than standing up and just lecturing at students. And you know that research experiences are a very effective way for students to learn about the process of science. Course-based research experiences, there's one at Brown. Somebody mentioned William and Mary. Somebody's daughter's at William and Mary. And so William and Mary has one of these. Um, Course-based research experiences are organized uh, courses, usually at the freshman level, so that students can uh, take part in authentic research. Uh, the one that we have at Brown, for example, is the C. Phages project. And I'd be happy to talk with you some more about it. Last year, we had 2,700 students, almost all freshmen, working in the C. Phages course at 74 different colleges and universities, and they're doing science. We just published a paper in eLife with 2,800 and something authors, 2,600 something were, were undergraduate. So change the introductory experience. Let them get a taste of what science is really about. A second part, a second suggestion that we have responsibility is to examine the evidence. And here's just one little piece of data. This is some data from Mike Nettles and Catherine Millette in their book, Three Magic Letters. Actually, we don't have a lot of evidence for this. This is the only published data that I can find. 
But if this is true, this is something that I think we need to really be thinking about. And so examining the evidence in this case, this example is just examine our expectations. So these data are, and all they asked was, of graduate students, what, uh, what percentage of students published their thesis work in a peer-reviewed uh, journal? And so whites and Asians, 48% of them published their work. International students, 40% published. But African Americans, according to this study, only 17% published. I would suggest that this is possibly uh, evidence that we have different expectations for students. But you know that if a student doesn't publish, she has very little chance for a future in science. And so this kind of evidence and other evidence, I think, is really important to gather. I was listening to all of you, and some of you were saying, you know, we got to know more about what our students are doing, where they come from, what they're doing afterwards, what their experiences is here. I think data are really important when we talk about uh, this work. And the third example of taking a responsibility is, again, to learn to work across differences. In the left, on the left is a graph of some data that were obtained by uh, Angelo Byers Winston and her colleagues at the University of Wisconsin. Angela works with dyad mentoring. And so they ask students and mentors, blue and mentors, red and the students, what's important? Is it important that you be the same race? And about a third of the both set of respondents said yes. Is it important that you be of the same sex? About a third said yes, it's important. And then the third question was, is it important to be able to talk about difference? And almost all of the mentees said yes, but the faculty were less prepared to do that. On the right is, is just a, a, a graph of the tenure track faculty in STEM, in science, in STEM, in the United States uh, versus the population today. And so we know that 30% of our students are underrepresented minorities, but only about 6% of the faculty are underrepresented minorities in this country. And so what that means is that there's a good chance that a faculty member will be working with students who are different than her. And so what do we, how do we learn to work across differences? Well, I think that um, even more than workshops, even more than me preaching to the choir here, I think it's important that administrators and faculty leaders encourage their colleagues to undertake intentional skills development in learning how to work across difference. And here are three things that I think should go into that skills development. First is to understand implicit bias. You know that there's been a lot of studies on implicit bias. You know that we all have implicit bias. So the, the, an, the answer is not to be cured of implicit bias, but rather to recognize that we have it and to learn or then to think about how you then deal with that. Molly Carnes at the University of Wisconsin runs a workshop on implicit bias. And she has shown and she has published that the impact of this workshop with science faculty is significant. The second thing that I think faculty need to learn in an intentional way is to understand the concept of privilege, of stereotypes, and of expectations. When I was at Purdue, uh, our provost, Sally Frost Mason, decided that all faculty in, in, in science and engineering, and then she expanded that to agriculture and actually all of the colleges, but we started off with engineering and then science, all of the faculty would go through a workshop on diversity. And this was a three-day workshop in which it was facilitated by outsiders, about 40 or 50 faculty members at a time, and we learned how to think about differences, about privilege, about listening. And it was, it was a remarkable experience because you get faculty to talk about something that's really hard. You get us to talk about race. And so we then just become, I think, really just much better at, at, at listening and, and at communicating. Um, when I moved to Harvey Mudd, Harvey Mudd's much smaller. And so we were able to cover the entire faculty in these same workshops in three workshops. And what we saw from these workshops at Harvey Mudd were policy changes that had really not, not specifically to do with becoming better at working with students from underrepresented groups, but rather had to do with the way faculty are recruited, 
had to do with the way we give homework in, at, at Harvey Mudd and, and, and things like that. So I really found that these to be really powerful. But these are, these are intensive, you know, three day, two and a half day workshops. At the end of that two and a half day workshop, what the facilitators would do would be that they would bring back to the group students who had come through our programs and had now graduated. This is about race and ethnicity, and so these would be underrepresented students. Not a lot, four or five students. And they, we would do a fishbowl. So the four or five students would sit in the middle with a facilitator, and the rest of us would sit on the outside listening. And by then, by two and a half days, we had learned a little bit more about the skills to listen. We were ready to listen. If this had happened on the first day, we would not have gone well. And the students then are just asked, how did it feel to be here at Purdue? Or how did it feel to be here at Harvey Mudd College? And what you hear from the students is absolutely remarkable, just stunning. I thought I was a pretty cool teacher. I got all these teaching awards. <laughs> I was good. Listen to the students, and they'll tell you how it felt to be in my class. That's really powerful. And so you learn to be motivated by feelings more than just by intellectual. The third thing is listening to understand. So I think it's important for faculty to, to, to learn how to listen to our students in a way that we actually are trying to understand them, where they're coming from. So I want to just summarize what I've tried to say this morning. Myths are powerful, but demand scrutiny. And metaphors are powerful and limiting. The pipeline metaphor does not capture the rich, rich complexity and dynamics of students. Students are not a commodity. They have agency. And faculty are not an inert pipe. We have responsibility. So another way of saying this is that instead of blaming the victim, I think it's really important for faculty leaders to step up and demand that faculty take responsibility. That's the difference, I think, that's going, I, I think that's one of the things that's going to make a difference in this country. So I showed you those curves at the beginning of the thing and how we need a different strategy. And I think the strategy has to do with faculty really learning how to do this in, a, in, a, in an intentional way. I want to close then by quoting another Supreme Court justice, my favorite Supreme Court justice, Sonia Sotomayor. And this is uh, her dissenting opinion in the... Um, this is the case that went up in the University of Michigan that upheld the, uh, the uh, you can't do affirmative action at, in Michigan. And she wrote this, and I'm just going to quote this. And race matters for reasons that really are only skin deep, that cannot be discussed any other way, and that cannot be wished away. Race matters to a young man's view of society when he spends his teenage years watching others tense up as he passes. Race matters to a young woman's sense of self when she states her hometown and then is pressed, no, where are you really from? Race matters to a young person addressed by a stranger in a foreign language, which he does not understand because only English was spoken at home. Race matters because of the slights, the snickers, the silent judgments that reinforce that most crippling of thoughts, I do not belong here. So race matters. Thanks very much for your time.